Chapter 6 Faith Section 1 If thou wouldst assume the master's role, wed unto faith like a wife, faith will sustain thee, nourish thy soul, and attain thee a mastery of life. Faith, the mighty tool. All things are rooted in faith. Even those of us who have the most difficulty applying this law to our daily lives will find innumerable instances in which we use it with perfect aplomb. We have complete faith that the food we eat will turn into blood and bone and muscle and tissue and fiber. Yet we do not know why or what causes it, and even the most erudite of us can do no more than follow the chemical process with all. We have faith that the air we breathe will combine with the sugar content of the blood to oxidize and form energy for the cells of our bodies. We don't stop to wonder or doubt or analyze this each time we draw a breath. We simply breathe, confident that we are doing the natural thing to sustain vigor and well-being. We have faith that the sun will rise, that the earth will revolve uniformly that the stars will maintain their places in the heavens. We have faith that we can walk across the street, talk to another person, understand him. We have faith in our own existence. Yet we admit we know the cause of none of these things. Our faith is blind. How strange it is that we so often scoff at faith in the less tangible fields of human existence. Faith led Moses to the Promised Land, Columbus to the West Indies, Pasteur to the Micro, Galileo to the stars, Democritus to the atom, Magellan around the world. Sustained by the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen, these men departed from the beaten paths and followed their visions, and all the world has benefited from their faith. Faith is the single most important tool of man's existence. In order to thoroughly understand this, let us return once again to the dual nature of mind. Returning to the Subconscious Our studies have shown us that the subconscious mind belongs to all persons and all things, and all of it belongs to any one of them. We have further seen that this mind is the substance from which all things are made, is the intelligence that permeates all creation, that its total and infinite effort is to become something in the physical world. What this mind becomes, we have seen, can only be the result of a thought or conception placed in the subconscious mind by conscious mind. The subconscious mind takes each conception given it and attempts to make this conception manifest in the physical world. We have observed that the subconscious mind cannot reason inductively. It cannot arrive at law by knowing a circumstance. It reasons only deductively. Whatever premise is given, it becomes law and is created into physical actuality. The subconscious mind is dynamically motor. Whatever premise is impressed upon it, it must create. It cannot know a premise without following this knowledge with creation. This is its law and nature, and most apparent function. Thus it can be seen that every circumstance and thing and form in the universe is the result of a conception in the universal subconscious mind, or the mind of God. We have further seen that each being is a result of infinite subconscious mind becoming a number of finite things in order to better know itself. It cannot know itself as something infinite but only by becoming something finite, and thus it is constantly becoming a vast number of things. The intelligent faculty built up in each of these things is what we have termed conscious mind, and is the subconscious mind's sole link with specific time and specific place. To illustrate, the subconscious mind is a vast intelligence without end, and each conscious mind is like a sense organ, keeping this intelligence informed as to the happenings in any particular place at any particular time. Whatever conclusions the conscious mind forwards to the subconscious mind, the latter immediately returns in physical reality. 
for the law of its nature is to become whatever it knows. Thus our thoughts are turned into things and we can neither start nor stop the process. We can only control our thinking. Thought plus faith creates. Now it is obvious that each of our thoughts is not turned into physical reality. Our conscious minds are capable of entertaining a hundred thoughts a second. If the subconscious mind were to create into physical reality each of the billions of thoughts entertained by humanity each second of every day, thus this world would be a very chaotic world indeed. It is apparent that there is a great selectivity exercised in choosing which of the thoughts of the conscious mind are to be accepted by the subconscious mind. And it is equally apparent that such selectivity is not exercised by the subconscious, but by the conscious mind instead. If we return to our discussion of hypnotism, we are able to see that the subconscious mind exercises no choice in the matter of which premises it will accept or not accept. When the conscious mind is asleep, as in the hypnotized person, the subconscious seizes on every suggestion offered and immediately attempts to turn this suggestion into truth. Obviously, then, the subconscious simply accepts any suggestion or any premise given it, and the only reason that all of our thoughts are not turned into physical reality is that they are not convictions of the conscious mind and therefore are not given in the subconscious. We are now able to see why it is that faith is such an important tool in the molding and determining of our lives. Faith is simply that factor which gives the impetus of conviction to a thought and thus impresses the thought upon the subconscious mind as a premise or conclusion which must be manifested in the physical world. Thus, anything you are convinced of must become real in your life. For thought plus faith creates. Faith is affirmation. As has been pointed out before, if some wise or omnipotent being were to live our lives for us, there would be no necessity for faith. This being could simply direct to the subconscious all those premises for good which would make our lives full and happy, and they would shortly come to pass. But the whole purpose of our lives is for us to provide the subconscious with conclusions, premises, and knowledge of what we encounter in our specific areas. And what we forward as convictions, the subconscious returns to us in physical reality. If the subconscious mind receives your conviction that you have money, you will have money. If it receives your conviction that you have health, you will have health. If it receives your conviction that you have love, you will have love. If it receives your conviction that you are successful, you will be successful. If it receives your conviction that you are wise, you will have wisdom. Whatever the premise, the subconscious mind will create it in physical reality. See how simple such a premise may be. I have money. Only that and money is manifested. Why is it that we have such difficulty in doing this simple thing? It is because we lack faith. It is because the thing we want is expressed as a hope. And in a million different ways throughout the day, we affirm our faith in the very opposite. Let us remember what Jesus said to those he healed. You are well. He did not argue or postulate or advance pros and cons on the matter. He simply gave the subconscious mind a premise upon which it had to act by its very nature. What does the hypnotist do? He simply says, You have no feeling in your arm, and the feeling immediately departs. It is upon such simple affirmations as these that the subconscious mind acts and always acts, and since we cannot think of anything, Without having certain convictions concerning it, the subconscious mind is always creating in our experience exactly what we believe. All decision is acceptance. For example, let us suppose that you set out to be a successful businessman. At the start of your venture, you correctly will have affirmed to yourself, I will be a successful businessman. 
It is this affirmation that starts you on the road. Now, let us suppose that you buy a quantity of merchandise, and when you offer it for sale, you find there are no takers. Your immediate premise is that you have made a mistake. This is followed, very closely, by the thought that you are about to lose a sizable amount of money. Shortly, you will be visualizing your business failure. Before long, you will have envisaged yourself as a bankrupt, without capabilities, without hope, beset on all sides by a cruel fate. What are you affirming now? You are affirming your business failure, of course. And as long as these convictions predominate in your thinking, there is no necessity for going to the office at all. For everything you do will be aimed at failure, and failure will be inevitable. You've got to think success to be successful. No one was ever successful by thinking failure. No one was ever a failure by thinking success. It is that simple. And the tool which we must use to prevent negative circumstance from entering our lives is that of faith. To return to the above example, the crucial point at which faith must be exercised is the point at which it becomes apparent that there is no market for the quantity of merchandise which the businessman has purchased. At this juncture, he must refuse to accept this as a mistake, as a forerunner of evil, as an indication of a forthcoming failure. He must affirm to himself the fact that he is to be a successful businessman and know that a power greater than he is directing him in the correct path. He must understand that it is not up to him to determine the ways and means and exact sequence of events by which he is to attain his end. He must understand that the great subconscious mind or God will affect its own ways and means and time in which to accomplish this. He must take to his heart the words of a very wise and very successful man who said, In every apparent failure, there is the seed of great opportunity, if we but have the heart and the faith to see it. The moment our businessman has refused to accept failure, has seen in his apparent negative circumstance only rung on the ladder to his ultimate goal. He will find the market for his goods created, perhaps in a far different manner than he originally had envisaged. And what could easily have been a disaster, he will have turned into a victory through faith and nothing more. The Psychology of Winning J. Hampton Poole is the head football coach of the Los Angeles Rams, one of the most successful teams in professional football. His quiet faith and dedication mark him as both man and coach, and well, they should, for he learned them on the hard ground of painful experience. At Stanford University, Hamp and I were teammates on a football team which was finishing a miserable season. We seemed to have good personnel, such outstanding players as Frankie Albert, Norman Stanley, Hugh Galarno, Pete Kamatovic, but with only one opponent remaining on our schedule. We hadn't won a single game. Night after night, Hamp and I sat around his Mayfield home, grousing. How could we expect to win? We told each other, when we had no offense, no leadership, no coaching. We blamed the alumni who were about to fire the coach. We blamed the coach for allowing the alumni to intimidate him. We blamed injuries. We blamed the weather. We blamed everything and everybody but ourselves. And why should we blame ourselves? Certainly we tried hard. Sometimes we lost 10 or 15 pounds in a game, carried bruised muscles and gashed lips for days as souvenirs of our efforts. Oh, we were trying all right, and so was everyone else. But the lickings continued monotonously. At last, we climbed aboard the train for New York and headed for our last game, this one with Dartmouth, the top team in the East. Certainly, if we hadn't won a game all season, there was nothing to hope for against Dartmouth. A pall of gloom settled over the entourage as we awaited this last defeat. The train sped through the Midwest on a bright winter's day, and Hamp and I sat in the club car and watched the white landscape. 
It was a pastoral scene, peaceful, strangely detached. Hemp turned to me. Stan, he asked, have you played your best this season? I was quickly defensive. You know I have, I said. You've seen me play myself into exhaustion. I didn't ask you if you got tired, he said. I asked if you played your best. He was looking me straight in the eye. There was nothing to do but be honest. No, I said, not even close to it, have you? He shook his head. No matter how I've tried, he said, I've fallen short. He looked out the window again. Why? he asked. Maybe we've tried too hard, I said. More likely not hard enough, he said ruefully. When the goal is impossible, I insisted, just trying itself can be awfully difficult. You mean we can't win? he asked. I mean we think we can, I said. He pursed his lips. Maybe you're right. Despite everything, the rallies, the fight talks, the good resolutions, I doubt we really believe we can win. We have faith that we can't win, I said, so we don't. Hamp struck his fist into the palm of his hand. All right, he said. Let's accept right now that we not only can win this next game, but we will win it. How about it? I was pretty doubtful. Saying it and believing it were two different things. It's possible, I conceded. Then what's to stop us, he cried. Eleven guys from Dartmouth, I answered. Then suddenly I grinned. But by golly, I believe we can do it. At that moment, the gloom evaporated from the club car and a load left my shoulders. I straightened. I began to feel good. Something must have happened to Hamp, too. He smiled and extended his hand. Shake on it, he said. We'll do our best. Better than our best if necessary. Because we're going to win. As I took his hand, I felt relaxed, serene and confident for the first time in months. We had a good time in New York because the burden was gone from our practice sessions. But most of all, we had a good time playing Dartmouth. Men made tackles they had never made before, caught passes they had never caught before, blocked punts they had never blocked before. We won. No one seemed able to understand it. How could a team that hadn't won a game all season manage to beat the leading team in the East? There were all sorts of speculation. There was even a little between Hamp and me. We were in the locker room after the game. I'm not even tired, he said with surprise, and I don't have a bruise or a scratch. It was almost easy, I said. Maybe it's always easy when you have faith, he said thoughtfully. Maybe it's having faith that's the only hard thing. Isolation brings fear. We human beings are creatures of little faith. We isolate ourselves from God, from the roots of our being, and we are ready to see on all sides a hostile and praying world that we are constantly going about our daily task, affirming our faith, disease, disaster, poverty, failure, and loneliness. Yet the reins of our destinies are in our very own hands. All things and evil have their beginnings in faith, and as ye believe so, it shall be done unto you. We shall have our beliefs anyway. Why not make them beliefs in good, in the fine ends of man, in abundance, in health, in vigor, in integrity? Let us use the word faith to mean the overcoming of negative thought. Let us use the word delusion to mean belief in negative circumstance and negative thinking. Be of good cheer, said Jesus. I have overcome the world. He had overcome all things by faith only. This is the lesson he left us, the most magnificent teaching in the history of mankind. Let us refuse to accept delusion. Let us take up faith like a sword and by using it overcome all things. The subconscious mind then turns into physical reality because of our beliefs. If we find lack, limitation, disease, and failure in our lives, we can be very sure that our own convictions have brought them. It seems strange, most of us find it so much easier, to attach our beliefs to negative things rather than positive. But there is no doubt but that this is mankind's tendency. Man isolates himself from God from his sense of unity with the infinite intelligence. 
than feeling himself a small and lonely animal in a vast universe. He supposes that the responsibility for all things in his life depends upon his own physical action. The moment any one of his physical actions is thwarted, he sees in this defeat the symbol of a bigger future defeat, and he feels about him a hostile world aimed only at thwarting his each desire. He sees in his smallness his own inadequacy and can forecast nothing for himself but those very fates that he fears. Thus he orders an existence, the very opposite of that which he truly desires. Becoming convinced of failure, disease, poverty, loneliness, and suffering, he is likely to undergo all of them while their opposites seem as unattainable as stars. Yet the truth is that these unattainable opposites might have come to him with the same ease as their bad counterparts had he only exercised his faith in the right direction. Power Through Union No man can consistently exercise faith in all aspects of his life without the secure knowledge that God is with him every minute of every day. Unless you are willing to give up your problems and turn them over to God, you will find that you are making very poor solutions of them indeed. For you will feel your own inadequacy at every turn in the road and will shortly be projecting more failure than success into the subconscious mind. Make your mind up right now that there isn't the slightest use trying to do anything by yourself. You just aren't big enough, and that is the plain truth of the matter. The millions of facts and circumstances beyond your ken and scope make of you a microbe on the face of the earth the moment you isolate yourself from the subconscious mind and say, I, all by myself, will do this thing. The first very apparent thing you will discover is that you don't know enough. The second is you will find yourself facing gigantic forces over which you have no control and against which you have no weapon. Defeat in every undertaking is then certain, and the only end is to be reduced to a groveling, whining, complaining, fear-ridden speck. But join forces with the subconscious mind and the entire universe speeds to answer your every need. Not without cause did Jesus refer to the subconscious mind as the Father who dwelleth within me. For indeed this wise and omnipotent Father knows of your every need before you voice it, and may effect an instantaneous manifestation in your life of whatever it is you are convinced of. The subconscious mind contains the knowledge of all ways and means and times, and you may rest your problem there with the surety that it will be answered with perfection. Do not keep examining the pot to see if the water is boiling. You don't have to double-check God. Don't make up your mind that your path should lead in a certain direction and then be disturbed because you find it is leading elsewhere. Know that your every step is unerringly guided on a perfect route to your destination. Whatever you consider to be a side road is not a side road at all but the best of all possible paths. Hold fast and faithfully to your conviction. The Perfect Partner He who takes up this life in full knowledge of his partnership with God will find splendor in everything he touches. He will see an ordered universe rushing to do his bidding. He will see the design of all things fitted to his every need. He will know that the senior partner is the one who carries out every decision, an infallible executive who never makes a mistake. He will begin to see himself as a beloved son, who needs only ask, and it shall be given, who needs only knock, and it shall be opened. He will make each of his decisions clear and without contradiction, and he will hold to them with complete confidence, until they have arrived in his world in answer to his call. He will know of his father's tireless energy and unbounded goodwill, but he will respectfully refuse to tax them by contradicting himself or by vacillating. 
He will not, for example, say, I'm going to be successful, and then a few hours or days later say, I'm not going to be successful. He will not say, do, don't, start, stop, give, withhold. He will have the courage and faith of his convictions and will reject all else until his desire becomes manifest in his life. Thus it is that he will achieve perfect faith, for he will know that all things rest with a power greater than he, that his image and conviction must become real in his life, for that is the law of the living. In his sense of oneness with God, he will never be alone, and all the power of the universe will dwell within him. He will no longer have to fight for faith. Faith will be as natural as breathing. Circumstance versus Faith But in the meantime, short of having arrived at this conscious oneness with God, faith is the tool with which we may overcome the negative convictions of the conscious mind. The prompters, buried pain remembrances which attract evil and limitation, may also be disposed of by faith. Are you beset by the lack of money? Then have faith that money will be yours. Are you ill? Then have faith that you will be well. Are you lonely? Then have faith that love and companionship, even now, are coming your way. Do you think you have failed at your heart's desire? Then have faith faith that you are following the path to its attainment. Act as if it were impossible to fail. Know with Jesus of Nazareth that all things are possible to him who believes. Because our conscious minds keep insisting that the physical world around us is final reality, we must use faith to regain our spiritual values. Our conscious minds accept every negative circumstance of our lives and are forever assuring us that these circumstances control us instead of the opposite. We may awake to a beautiful morning, arise from bed full of faith and energy. This feeling may see us through breakfast and be with us on our way to work. Then a driver lurches his car in front of us in traffic, and we slam on the brakes with our hearts in our mouths. You stupid fool! We say, maybe out loud, certainly to ourselves, and now we are irritated. The day is not so bright. We don't feel quite as good. We start thinking about the boss and the calling down he gave us the other day. Suddenly it seems quite apparent that the boss is out to make our life miserable. We walk into the office with a chip on our shoulder. Shortly we may be in an argument. We don't like the job anymore. It's underpaid. Nobody appreciates us. Fate seems to conspire, to keep us from attaining success. And so it goes. He who would use faith must use it to rise above negative circumstance, and he must never fall victim to that which goes on around him. Refuse to be trapped into believing that the cause of anything exists on the physical plane. Have complete confidence in the fact that first cause is mental, and first cause, when set in motion, must inevitably manifest itself in the physical world. Do not deny negative circumstance. Simply have faith in what you believe and refuse to accept negative circumstance as final. This is the proper use of faith. For faith will overcome the deluded convictions of the conscious mind, build habits of positive thinking, which is the first step on the road to power. Positive thinking. Faith is nothing other than a sustained effort to impart to the universal subconscious mind that thought which you wish to be manifested in your experience. Faith means thinking the one thing and not thinking of its opposite. Faith means refusing to accept any negative circumstance or to entertain any negative thought. Faith means complete reliance and trust in the power and goodness of God, and absolute trust that whatever you conceive with conviction will be returned to you in this world. There is no end to the power of positive thinking. He who banishes negative thoughts from his mind is caught up in the entire expanding power of the universe. Yet it is a difficult thing to do, 
So involved are we in our habits of negative thinking, so directed as automatons by our buried pain, remembrances, the prompters. A man may have in his mind all the knowledge that exists in our libraries, but unless he becomes a positive thinker, he will meet with nothing but failure in his life. He does not want failure, who does, who wants to be sick, poor, lonely, unsuccessful. A man may even acknowledge that his own negative thinking is attracting negative circumstance to him, yet despite his efforts he seems caught up in the habit of thought that will not release him. He may go for hours, even days, fighting off every mood of depression, turning his mind away from every negative idea. Then of a sudden, something, usually a small thing, the baby crying, the dripping faucet, a brusque word, will set him off, and he surrenders to morbidity and his accustomed habits of negation, much as a chronic alcoholic might return to the bottle after a period of abstinence. He wallows in futility, actually seems to enjoy it. He takes a kind of masochistic satisfaction from being able to state to himself that the whole world is against him, and nobody appreciates him, and he never had a chance and fate conspires daily to do him a dirty trick. He finds an ache in his back. He rediscovers his indigestion, develops sick headaches from tension. His nerves will not let him sleep. He becomes jumpy and cranky with friends and associates alike. He is busy. Yes, indeed, very busy. Attracting those very things which he says he does not want. Chapter 6. Faith. Section 2. Fear and Delusion. Negative Faith. Oh, but if it were real easy, he would do it. If he knew that all he had to do was think positive thoughts for 24 hours a day, and the next day he would have a fine job, lots of money, a happy home, prestige and achievement, he certainly would do it then, wouldn't he? But when it takes longer than that, he gives up the ghost, giving little or no heed to the fact that he is still working with the exact same factors, except now he is using his faith in the opposite direction, in the direction of evil, limitation, lack, and disease. A strange situation has evolved, a situation in which people today find it effortless to use faith to attract evil and in which they find it exceedingly hard work to use faith for good. Certainly this is a paradox. Certainly in the ages of man's evolution it is a temporary thing, but that doesn't dissolve its tragic importance to those who face the problem now. It seems easy for us to have faith in negative things because we have built up habits of negative thinking. These habits of negative thinking are as difficult to break as any habit which is as long seated, usually 30 to 50 years with most of us. But if we know that positive thinking attracts good and negative thinking attracts evil, then certainly we are all in accord that the primary immediate aim is to do away with negative thinking. In other words, break the habit. It is no more difficult to break than any habit, and one's broken need never bother you again, for you will then know its pitfalls and will not be tempted. The Bad Habit It is often a very fantastic thing to observe a man accept temporarily the premise that positive thinking can change his life, then discard this transcendent truth as unworkable after the most perfunctory trial. He might, for instance, decide today to alter his thinking and approach to life. He might actually change his outlook and attitudes very considerably for a period of a week or even a month. If at the end of that time, however, he has not been witness to a miracle, he all too often raises his hands in despair and shouts, It doesn't work! and falls immediately into his former habits of thinking. A lifetime of negative thinking will not be undone in a week. Don't for a moment fall into the trap of thinking that unless results are immediate, you are on the wrong track. It is a case of faith or fear 
and fear is the only negative use of faith. No matter how you choose to think, you are calling into existence those very things you believe in. The choice, then, is simple. Good or evil. There is in this life no alternative to faith other than fear and evil. No sane person understanding this will dally with this choice. But how do you undo the habit? That is the problem. A bad habit seldom yields to half-hearted measures, and negative thinking is certainly the most persistent and destructive habit ever assimilated into the mind and nature of mankind. To get at this fellow requires measures as sure and aseptic as the surgeon's knife, and thus it is. We offer you the only tool possible. Breaking the Bad Habit if a doctor discovers that your body is not receiving the proper nutrition, he puts you on a diet. His reasoning on this is simple. He discovers that certain elements and vitamins and minerals are lacking in the chemical composition of your body. Therefore, he would restore their proper balance by having you eat certain foods that contain them in abundance. In any event, he asks you to exercise a conscious choice in the foods you eat selecting some and rejecting a great many more. It is just such a procedure confined entirely to the mind and spirit which we shall ask you to adopt for the next 30 days. In other words, we are asking that you go on a 30-day mental diet. For 30 days, one month, you are not to accept a single negative thought nor dwell on a single negative premise. This does not mean that such thoughts or ideas will not occur to you. They most certainly will occur, as frequently or even more so than they have all your life. This simply means that you will refuse to accept any of them, discarding them immediately when they occur as fictional ideas, without basis in truth, delusions that are without foundation, for they have no roots in your mind. In this manner, by consciously exercising a choice of that which you allow to become part of your mind, by deliberately planting only positive seeds in the garden of the subconscious, you will not only set about an eventual harvesting of the greatest bumper crop of good ever to enter your life, but more important, you will be building up a habit of positive thinking that will become easier and easier day by day. Eventually, you will no longer have to struggle with positive and negative, good and evil, truth and illusion. You will ally yourself with the forces for good in the universe and achieve an attunement and an effortlessness in life that once seemed impossible of imagining. The Mental Diet What are these thoughts that we are going to refuse to entertain? There are any thoughts that might, in the smallest or greatest manner, cast into a pessimistic or poor light yourself, your family, your friends, your social group, your state, your nation, or the entire human race. They are, in short, negative thoughts of any type, regardless of whether they seem personally aimed at yourself or even at an inanimate object. Now, don't be blind about this and say, Oh, I never think negatively. And don't be fearful about it and say, I couldn't manage to concentrate on that sort of thing for 30 days. Don't say you haven't got time. Don't say it won't work. We needn't even point out how and why each of these attitudes destroys the goal even before the experiment has begun. Before you start the 30-day mental diet, Spend a day or two observing how your mind is working. Carry a notebook and a pencil with you, if you will, and keep a record of each negative thought you entertain for a period of two days. The result will astound you and convince you beyond all doubt of the absolute necessity of embarking on the mental diet. This is going to be no easy time, discarding every negative thought for a period of 30 days. But it is something you absolutely must do. Until you become master of your thinking, you will never become master of your fate. If you fall from the path of your resolve and entertain negative thoughts, 
become depressed, apprehensive, pessimistic. There is nothing to do but start over. You must negotiate 30 days of positive thinking without any serious intrusion of negative thought. It is exceptionally important that you do this thing. Let nothing stand in your way. During the period of your mental diet, you will be helped by understanding exactly what it is you are doing. You are training your mind to obey you rather than you obey it. You are training yourself to think more of less and less of more. In other words, you are developing the habit of concentration as well as the habit of positive thinking. Too many thoughts. We humans think altogether too much on altogether too many things. In the space of a single moment, our minds may embrace a hodgepodge of unrelated ideas and half-formed conceptions, such as could not be found on the printed page outside of the Encyclopedia Britannica. We jump helter-skelter from one idea to the next, unguided, unguarded, seizing on whatever is presented to us across the moving screen of mind and declaring it to be real. We start the subconscious mind moving in one direction, halt it, start it off in another, recall it, send it off again, recall it, literally, hundreds of times each day. We have developed habits of absolutely undisciplined thinking, and very often, where any discipline at all is present, it is aimed at negative thinking. One moment we are happy and entertain happy thoughts. Then a shadow crosses the face of the sun and we entertain unhappy thoughts. A friend pays us a compliment and we feel important and vain. An acquaintance castigates us and we entertain thoughts of resentment and bitterness. Always we wait for impetus from outside to determine what thoughts we will accept and which we will reject, and thus we become victims of every wind that blows and every twig that falls, and the temper of our lives is determined by countless unending streams of circumstances over which we have no control. Scarce, indeed, is the man who sets himself up to accept only certain thoughts and beliefs and firm in his faith and foundation outweighs the world to achieve his ends. The sea and the mountain, the storm, and the stars shall not persevere against such a man, and he shall move the very ends of the earth. Do we think? As human beings we have been tricked into believing that we think. In other words, we believe we make thoughts. It is a peculiar thing that we believe this, since no one, has ever been able to say whence a thought comes and from what it is made. But nevertheless, most treatises on the mind hold that man thinks of things and makes up thoughts. Yet if you carefully analyze the process of thought, you will find that it is not you who thinks at all, but it is rather you who observes thoughts as they flit across your consciousness. Stated differently, it is as if the real you occupied a still and guarded position in the very recesses of your being, from which you observe a purely mental world that consists entirely of thoughts. These thoughts parade across your consciousness in a never-ending stream, following one upon the other unceasingly. Some you select and add to you, others you reject and send on their way. But the plain an irrevocable fact is that it is not you who sets the stream of thoughts in motion. If you doubt this, try to stop it. You will find that all your efforts cannot stop your thinking, for the essence of being is observation, contemplation, and choice. And though you may slow the stream of thoughts a very great deal and examine each thought presented to you with much more care, Still they come, these thoughts from out of nowhere, exhibiting themselves before your consciousness, demanding of you that you establish a position and accept some while you reject others. A writer who sits down and writes a novel does not think up his story and his characters. He simply puts himself in the position of someone who is going to write a story. 
Then he observes the thoughts and ideas that cross his consciousness. On and on they come, and he rejects them, until finally there comes an idea which appeals to him. This idea he takes unto himself, and examines, and then accepts. Now, instead of just being in the position to write a story, he is in a position of writing a story about a man who is, let us say, alone on a desert island. He wonders how the man got there, and on the stream of thoughts come, and he accepts one. And now he is writing a story about a man who is marooned on a desert island by pirates. And so it goes with each of the facets and details of his story. In no case does he think them up. His entire story, once assembled and written, is simply evidence of the thousands of choices he has made from the thoughts that have streamed through his mind. He has not thought up a thing. He has simply exercised choice. His story tells you what he has accepted. Nothing will ever tell you the millions of ideas and thoughts which he has rejected. We choose thoughts. Like the writer who authors a story, each of us authors his own life by his choice of what thoughts he will accept and which he will reject. Each of our lives is a story unfolded by the silent contemplative author who dwells within us, who does nothing more than accept and reject who is involved only in making choices. This indwelling self says, This is so. This is not so. I believe this. I feel fine in this circumstance. I feel badly in this circumstance. I am great. I am nothing. There is hope. There is despair. And each of these choices is manifested in the physical world. We are today living testimonies to the choices we have made from the thoughts that have streamed through our minds. We are literally products of the thoughts we have chosen to accept. We are what we believe we are. That only, nothing more or less. So it is that the mental diet upon which we are about to embark is so important. We have assured the indwelling self that it can be anything it accepts and has faith in, and we are now about to develop in it the habit of choosing only those thoughts and ideas that will constructively add good unto it. We are teaching ourselves to accept only good. We are teaching ourselves to reject all evil. We are deliberately compelling ourselves to accept all love, all kindness, all hope, all joy, all expansion, all abundance, all health, all vigor. We are deliberately compelling ourselves to reject all suffering, all sorrow, all depression, all morbidness, all inferiority, all aches and pains. We are saying nothing is true, but the great and the good and the beautiful. Only these will we add unto ourselves. For thirty days we stand guard with the habit forms. Thereafter, though we may relax a little, we will not let go our sentinel, for we know that we are only what we accept from the thoughts that come to us. And more than ever, the wisdom of Jesus is brought home. As ye believe, so shall it be done unto you. St. Augustine wrote, I, Lord, went wandering like a strayed sheep, seeking thee with anxious reasoning without, whilst thou was within me. I went round the streets and squares of the city seeking thee. I found thee not, because in vain I sought without for him who was within myself. Heed the silent dweller in the recesses of your being. Know that to him all things are possible according to what he accepts. You are what you choose to be, and your choice is made in the mind. Seek the high and forsake the low. A man adds all things unto himself simply by taking a position with impregnable faith. Rising above circumstance The world is too much with us, and we think far too much. In the process of our 30-day mental diet, we must learn to slow the stream of our thoughts 
and we must learn to deny the final reality of the physical world about us. The first of these aims may be accomplished by a simple breathing exercise and meditation. The latter is far more difficult. It is a fine thing to awake in the morning full of the exultation of a vision that has come to us in the night, to rise from bed full of a vague remembrance of a brilliance and a peace that surpassed everything. We are uplifted, quickened with new faith and new resolve. For a few minutes we are nearly convinced that we have found the way, but how easily we let go of our faith, and how stupidly. There is a spot on the suit we have decided to wear, or a best dress has sprung a seam. The toaster isn't working properly, and our toast is burned. We spill our milk, or our coffee, or somebody else does. The car doesn't start, or we miss our bus. We receive a fancied slight on the street. It is a bad day. Nothing ever seems to go right for us. The vision is long gone, and we seem to be little ants in a limitless universe hemmed in on all sides by destructive and malicious forces and by designing and praying beings. We are angry and resentful. Thus, we are victimized. Thus, we deny the magnificent indwelling self. Thus, we are prompting the universal subconscious mind in those very directions we do not wish to go. Thus, because we have accepted the physical world about us as having a higher reality than that world that exists only in mind, we have become pawns in a game of physical fate over which we have no control. It matters not whence the thought comes, whether it filters to your consciousness in the silence of your bedroom, or whether it comes to you in the clatter of a busy workday world. If you accept it, then it becomes a part of you and will be added to you in the physical world. Thus you are continually accepting premises and convictions that are forced upon you by the circumstances and people and the events you meet, even though they are often very contrary to what you really desire. It is this we mean when we say the world is too much with us. Judge not by appearances, said Jesus. If you would win your way to the manifestation of those things that are your goals, you must not be swayed from your conviction and faith by any of the events or circumstances you meet in your daily life. Whatever is contrary to your belief, you must reject as not having reality, as being only a temporary thing, a detour on the road you follow, not a setback at all, but a necessary path to follow. For the whole plan rests in universal mind, and though it may seem at the moment to be going against your desires, have no fear. We will accept from the thought things in the world around us only those which add to our faith and our conviction in the goals we have set for in ourselves. All other thought things we reject as being only temporary and lacking final reality. Thus, in the inner recesses of our beings, we maintain a place of quiet, assurance, and contemplation, steadfast always in our knowledge that our faith will become manifest in our lives. It is then we who set the temper of our thoughts. It is then we who achieve mastery over our fates. Our positions are unassailable. We create from within and are never victims of circumstance. Thought control. Equally important in arriving at mental control and faith is our ability to slow down the helter-skelter stream of thoughts that flow across our consciousness. It is the flittering, haphazard conscious mind, never unified in purpose, always prompting the subconscious mind in dozens of different directions, that produces chaos in our surrounding world. We must harness the conscious mind. Control it. Guide it in the paths we would follow. Daily, just prior to your meditation period, you must practice the process of slowing your thought stream. Seek a place of quiet and solitude. Find a comfortable, restful seat. Relax every muscle. Start at the top of your head and move downward over your whole body. 
Relax the muscles around your eyes and forehead, your cheek and lip and jaw muscles, the muscles in your neck. Let your head low. Move it slowly around in a circle on your relaxed neck. Relax the muscles in your shoulders and your arms and your hands. Let your hands hang loosely. Relax your stomach muscles, your abdomen. Carefully relax all the muscles in your back, your thighs, your calves. Feel the weight of your legs. Rest like this for several minutes and know that you are fully relaxed. Then concentrate on your breathing. Gradually begin to slow the taking of each breath. Make each inhalation a little deeper. Breathe comfortably and peacefully, pausing at the end of each inhalation and exhalation. But do not pause so long that you begin gasping. Slowly your respiration will reduce itself until your breathing is scarcely noticeable. Slowly, there will come over you a sense of peacefulness and drowsiness and security and comfort. Your mind will glide like a boat into a calm lagoon of unruffled and placid waters and you will feel a sense of contentment. It is quiet there, so quiet that you can hear the voices of your soul. Think very slowly, deliberately. Watch your thoughts as they cross your consciousness. Hold on to them and examine them, but let them go. Neither accept nor reject them. Notice how each thought follows one upon the other in an endless stream of traffic. Now ask yourself, who is it that observes this? It will come upon you that it is not you who thinks at all. It is you who observes and decides that only. Who is I? Ask yourself who this observer is that you refer to as I. It is not thought. It is not body. It simply is, has being, observes, in the contemplative sense in which you feel it now. It is neither past nor present nor future, but simply exists. I am. I observe. I decide. Here is your true being. Here is your real self, the unfettered, untrammeled, eternal spectator. To find this point of consciousness from which all things and thoughts and moods are a matter of observation is to find the spiritual center of gravity, is to know yourself in all your true freedom and joy. This I, this observer, is the indwelling God, the real self, the personal consciousness, that is in all things and all life. To know it truly and at all times is to have the consciousness of Jesus Christ. Thus, in your daily practice of thought control, when you have slowed the thought stream after relaxation and breath control, turn always to the self that dwells deep within you. Find the point of consciousness from whence all things are but observations. Then ask, who is this that observes? Of this point of consciousness did Jesus speak when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all things shall be added unto you. The arrival at this point of consciousness is the attainment of the peace that passes all understanding, and is the position from which all things are possible, without effort, without the exercising of will, but simply through contemplation and choice. These things, then, we will do in our 30-day mental diet. We will first reject all negative thoughts and ideas and circumstances and refuse to add them to ourselves. We will entertain only positive thoughts of good and abundance and joy and love and kindness and success. We will daily engage in a period of thought control, which we will achieve with the aid of breathing exercises always aiming at arriving at that point of consciousness, where all things and thoughts are a matter of observation. From there we will engage in our meditations each day. This will prove to be one of the most rewarding times of your life, not only because of the manifestations you meet within the physical world, but also because of the lowering sense of peace and strength that will come to you as you grow to know the magnificence that is yours. 
you will sense the unity of all things. Come to understand that nothing is done by man alone, but all things are done by the universal subconscious mind or the mind of God. You will further see that all of that mind is in you now and all the days to come. And you will understand that you have nothing to do but decide each of the issues of your life and put your faith and trust in the wisdom and omnipotence of this all-knowing mind. Leave it to God. We are a civilization of people who suffer from a I-have-to-do-a-complex. We believe that the responsibility for all things settles on our shoulders. Being materialist, we have great difficulty in analyzing anything except in a material sense. And our problems are largely confined to those of finding jobs, getting better jobs, and making more money. We sense our inadequacy as we set out to beat the world. And this makes us all the more frantic in our rushing around, hurrying back and forth, worrying about this and worrying about that. Though the slogan on America's silver coin says, In God we trust. We deny this as we set out to collect as many of these coins as we can. Henry David Thoreau wrote, Whatever we leave to God, God does and blesses us. The work we choose should be our own. God lets alone. Perhaps the most difficult thing each of us has to learn is to let go and let God. As long as we keep our problems with us, dwelling on each aspect of them, lending reality to each negative quality, we can perceive or construe we are defeating our own ends. The mighty power of the universal subconscious mind Recognizing our command that we are determined to do things by ourselves filters into our lives in a tiny trickle over the dam we have built against it. But once turn your problem over to the universal mind with the request. Here, you handle it. And the dam is removed and the torrent flows and miracles are wrought before our very eyes. Such miracles that we can only wonder with awe at how lucky we are or how beneficent are the circumstances that surround us. Do not dwell on your problems. Never keep any problem in your mind for more than a few minutes at a time. Consider the issues and the possible paths or courses of action you might take. If you cannot decide what to do, turn the problem over to subconscious mind. With the sure knowledge that the correct answer will be returned to you, you may return to your problem daily, thinking on its various aspects once again. It may be during one of these periods that the answer will come to you, though just as likely it will come upon you at any moment of the day, all unsuspecting. Whenever the moment comes, you will entertain not the slightest doubt but that the answer is truth. It will burst upon you like a light and very likely you will chastise yourself for not having been aware of it before. It will suddenly seem so simple. Once you have made your decision, forget about your problem altogether. Secure in the knowledge that its execution rests in the most capable hands in the universe. Reaffirm your faith in your goal by meditation. But under no circumstances try to predict the manner in which the subconscious mind will make it manifest. If you yourself have forecast certain steps that must be accomplished by a certain time, and you find that such steps are not taken and even opposite or conflicting ones are taken, don't turn craven and lose your faith. You have turned the execution of your problem or your work over to the wisest intelligence in all creation. And it is not your part to tell it what it should do or what it ought to have done in order to get where you both are going. If you really think you would be a better pilot, then there is nothing for you to do but take the helm. But if, like most of us, you have spent many years at that helm without chart or compass or navigational instruments, only to founder on the rocks and shoals of life, you will wisely leave the helm and the navigation up to the one who knows, and not keep trying to tell him where he ought to steer or saddle yourself with emotional upset and antagonistic thinking when he doesn't steer where you think he ought to. 
faith is trust. All of us are much too likely to predict the way things should happen, and when they fail to follow the pattern of our predictions, we are sure our goals will be denied us. Thus, we defeat ourselves. A man decides to write a book. Assuming that his image and faith are clear, he actually sits down and after a period of time gets the book done. He sends it off to a publisher and a while later receives the manuscript back with a rejection slip. He can now decide that the book is no good, do no more about it, and thus bring failure upon himself. Or he can entertain a respect for the publisher's decision, look the manuscript over carefully and decide whether or not it needs rewriting. If it doesn't, and this is a rare case indeed, he should reaffirm his faith and send it off to another publisher and keep sending it until the book is finally accepted, for accepted it will be if his faith remains true. More likely, however, he will rewrite it after each rejection, for what he has affirmed to the subconscious mind is that he will write a book good enough to be published, and his rejection slips are only part of the means by which he will turn the book into his best possible effort. Faith is actually, in the end, little more than persistence, and a drop of water will wear away a rock if it keeps beating at it endlessly. Nothing stands against repeated effort. Bare feet wear cobblestones away. The soft morning dew repeated over years will dissolve iron. He who holds his image clear and true will arrive safely in harbor no matter the unsuspected seas or storms he weathers en route. But wherever we go, whatever we do, we must always know that the subconscious mind is our muddy and invisible partner. The subconscious is our executive vice president, our crewland staff, advisor, and confessor. We have nothing to do but lean back in our chairs and observe and decide. And the mightiest force in the universe leaps to do our bidding. But we must delegate to our great partner, full authority. He is the Ways and Means Committee, and his nature is to work secretively. We cannot second-guess him, countermand his various moves. He requires complete trust and confidence. And once he sets about a task we have given him, we must leave everything up to him. Interference at any point, he interprets as meaning a new goal, and he immediately sets about achieving this new one instead. We must learn to leave him alone, to let go of our problems as soon as he has taken them. Once we have learned to do this, we will find that his nature is to wind things up in a jig time and in the most marvelous manner. Once we have completely given over to him any one of our problems and been witness to the manner in which he solves it, we will never again doubt or disbelieve. Faith versus Hope One of the traps we so often fall into is the confusion of hope with faith. Hope has scarcely any relation to faith at all, and though many times more desirable than despair, nevertheless is a frail instrument indeed for moving the subconscious mind. Hope is a pessimist looking at things optimistically. Hope is a querulous wish for something better. Hope says evil is more real than good, with a timid reservation that everything might turn out all right anyway. It is no wonder that those who seek to better their lives through hope are very seldom witness to improvements. It is an understandable thing that most of us set about the projects of our lives with hope instead of faith. Hope is a dimly perceived light, now flickering faintly in the darkness now obscured by the gloom. Hope is wishing. Faith, on the other hand, is a radiance that bathes all things in illumination. Faith is knowing. Because we tend to attach primary importance to the material world, because we fail to perceive the design and purpose of our lives, because we refuse to let go of our problems and labor under burdens of tremendous responsibility, it is extremely difficult for us to know and thus is extremely difficult 
for us to have faith. Whatever we know to be a fact, we have complete faith in, whether we understand how it works or not. You throw the lever on a switch with complete faith that the lights in the room will illuminate, yet the methods by which electricity is picked up in generators, transmitted over lines, distributed to your home, and finally achieves the miracle of light by heating a tiny filament in a vacuum sealed by transparent glass are most probably little known to you. You know that the lights will go on when you throw the switch because you have tried it before and it works. Thus, you have complete faith. Similarly, on the intangible planes of human existence, we need not achieve full knowledge of why and how everything works and is constructed. We need only try working with spiritual law, discover that it works, and thus come into complete faith through knowing. But dealing with the spiritual and mental forces of the universe is far different than dealing with things of the physical world, where our five senses are constantly giving sharp definition and substance to everything with which we come in contact. We are sure of the physical things we see, feel, hear, smell, and taste. We have complete faith in the reality of their existence. Far less faith do we have in the reality of mind and the great forces of spiritual existence. We hope for them. We timidly experiment with them. But because they do not follow the same pattern of demonstration as the physical world, we abandon them, usually, at the first failure. Faith is a mental law. The truth is that the physical world has accustomed us to the wrong use of faith. In material things, our faith habitually follows demonstration, while in spiritual or mental things, faith must always precede demonstration. The constant analogy that we draw between things physical and things mental causes us to believe that mental law must parallel physical law and we omit to notice the great difference. Physical law does not need our faith to be operative. Mental law follows our faith exactly, indeed is faith. Thus the difficulty in perceiving the great world of mind and spirit in which we dwell. It sometimes sounds extremely childish to say to a person who is distraught with problems and griefs that he may overcome them all by simply having faith. The reason for this is that the person who is in such a position is acutely aware of physical circumstance and has denied the reality of the realm of mind and spirit. Knowing the physical so well, he has denied his true being and has lost his faith. It becomes almost Pollyannish to insist that a person use faith under such circumstances, for faith is knowing, and at the moment he cannot know. Only by communion with the indwelling self, the quiet assured place in the recesses of his being, will he come into the possession of true knowledge and thus complete faith. So it is that one man can never insist with success that another man have faith, nor can any man insist that he himself have faith when he is beset by doubt and fear. Faith only comes through knowledge and the precepts that are contained in the pages of this book, plus their daily meditations and communions with the indwelling I, will bring this knowledge home with full force and achieve for you a faith that will turn life into glorious adventure. Review Here are the points covered in this chapter. 1. All things are rooted in faith which is the single most important tool of man's existence. 2. The subconscious mind turns every conviction of the conscious mind into physical reality. 3. The subconscious mind knows specific time and place circumstance only through the convictions forwarded to it by the conscious mind. 4. Whatever the subconscious mind knows, the subconscious mind creates. 5. Thought plus faith creates. 6. Faith in negative things is delusion, 
but nevertheless moves the subconscious mind to create them in physical actuality. 7. Negative faith or delusion is caused by man isolating himself from the universal subconscious mind and making fear and resentment and hate his companions through his sense of separateness. 8. Faith is attained through complete trust and confidence in the power of universal mind. 9. The unity of all things and all people, indwelling in the immortal self of the universe, is the essence of faith. 10. Faith is a spiritual value and must be maintained in a spiritual manner. Therefore, it can never be dictated by the circumstances that surround you. 11. He whose faith vacillates with the events of his life allows himself to become a victim of every wind that blows and every twig that falls and is never his own master. 12. Faith is sustained effort. 13. Faith is persistence. 14. Faith is knowing, while hope is little more than wishing. 15. Don't fall into the trap of hoping for things. It will avail you little. 16. Positive thinking is the cornerstone of faith. 17. Refuse to add negative thoughts and circumstances onto yourself. Choose only the good and the great and the beautiful. The rest is delusion. 18. The mind may be trained in the habit of positive thinking through a training period called a 30-day mental diet. 19. The inner self does not make up thoughts. It only observes and chooses. Your life today is a result of the thoughts you have chosen to accept. 20. Turn your problems over to the universal subconscious mind. You will find the answers and be guided in the right paths. 21. Don't, under any circumstances, tell the subconscious mind how to do things. Let go and let God. 22. When negative circumstance arises, know that it is but temporary, a necessary route to the goal you inevitably will achieve as long as your faith remains with you. 23. Daily seek the consciousness of the indwelling spectator, the place of calm and unruffled quiet, where all things are known and understood. 24. Seek to know. Subordinate all things to faith, for faith must precede all demonstration. The Road Ahead You have now arrived at the crossroads of understanding. There is much to do. There is first the 30-day mental diet which you must perform faithfully and assiduously and which must be carried to successful completion no matter how many false starts you may make. There is, second, the breathing exercises and the period of communion with the indwelling self in which you seek contact with the eternal eye, your true being. And of course, there are the meditations which you must perform directly after the breathing exercises and communion. Once again, may we caution you that failure to carry out the work will lose for you the greatest value that can be gained from your study, demonstration of good in your life. Only through such demonstration will the full knowledge come to you of your own self-mastery. Without this, you are simply performing mental exercises. Knowledge without faith is a ship without a sea. It may be beautiful to behold, but it does very little good. Do the work. Perform the meditations. Keep the faith. Recommended Reading Power to Constructive Thinking by Emmett Fox